Hi, everyone. Uh, so thanks for joining our uh, next weekly webcast. Uh, so today, um, we're going to be talking about patient enrollment specialists or patient outreach specialists, um, how to find good uh, specialists, how to um, train them, um, what they should be expected to do. Um, and we have a very special guest today. So we have Al Peters, uh, who's the president of BCC Network and the Vice President of ClinEdge. Um, as uh, some of you guys may know, he's owned sites for many years and he has been instrumental in implementing and maintaining strong uh, pre-screening teams um, at sites that he's worked with. Um, so uh, we're going to kind of do something similar to what we did last week um, and do kind of a, an interview format with Al. So Al, I don't know if you want to say anything before we get into it. I've been chasing Scott around the office for the last, I think, about a month now to try to get on this webinar, and he kept telling me that I, I didn't have what it what it takes, and I, I think somebody must have canceled early because he finally is allowing me on. So no, I'm I'm um, I'm super excited to be on. As Scott um, uh, alluded to, I I come from the site side, so I, for any of the um, study owners on the on the call or coordinators, uh, I I feel your pain to say the least. I've, uh, I've been a coordinator for many years. I've been a patient recruitment specialist, a regulatory specialist. I've worn all the hats. So uh, to say the least, I can I can relate. And uh, no, thanks for having me on. Awesome. Well, uh, so we'll start and get right into it. So uh, a lot of sites call in all the time, tell us that it's very difficult to find a good outreach specialist. So how do you find a good, what kind of person makes a good outreach specialist? You know that's a great question. I um, it's I think you got to think outside the box. You would think that it would be a a medical person or a previous coordinator or a potential coordinator, but I don't think I don't think that's what we've seen work on our end. Um, for us, it's it's been a little bit about you know first of all the the phone presence. So being able to connect with a person over the phone and have that personal touch. You have to be able to be personable and be able to. Um, you know, just have the relationship with the with the person on the other line. We have also found that um, for, for whatever reason, guys that have a little bit of a sales background have done well. I'm not saying that there's any selling involved, but they've had the experience of dealing with people, with communication, with understanding how to um, how to adjust their dialogue based on the person they're speaking with. So whether it's a you know a, a, a age group or, or culture background or whatever it may be. They really had that experience. So we found that definitely guys with previous sales background have worked well. Um, I think that two things that we do which have been beneficial to us is number one, we, we hire for the position. So we don't utilize the, the recruitment uh, position as a stepping stone to a coordinator um, or to be a CRA or a regulatory or anything else. We truly hire for that position. So we look for the right fit for a person that we know is going to be in that position for a long period of time. Uh, that's number one. Number two, we definitely look at work history. So for us, a big one is is you know is consistency at a, a previous job. Um, we want to see that they've been reliable and consistent, and they've held a job for two years or greater. Um, and then you get into the other components. Again, it's not for us. It's not only medical. We also look at um, uh, everything else because we we know we can teach the position. We can teach inclusion, exclusion. Um, so for us, it's definitely about the person, and we hire them to be in the job, uh, job long term. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely you want to be able to have somebody who can, as you said, talk to patients, and they're really that first um, line that the patients are going to talk to. And um, oftentimes, we find the outreach specialists are going to be very instrumental in helping that dropout rate because if they know what's expected of them for the study, um, you know and they feel comfortable with that first person they're talking to, oftentimes they can have a positive impact on how well you do with the study. So definitely um, a lot of great points there. Um, so how do you set goals for this person? You know, do you, you know, what kind of short-term goals, long-term goals, how do you, you know, make sure that they're productive and that they're, um, you know, being efficient at, you know, what we want them to be able to do? Yeah, I think, you know, setting expectations is extremely important in, in any role that you have, and it's it's a philosophy at our sites and at our company in general. And um, I would say, first of all, that the we look at the recruitment staff, the, especially the, the pre-screeners, as, you know, 
as important as the coordinators. It's an important piece of, of the company. And when you look at the overall revenues that can be generated off a of productive recruitment staff, just one, it's it's absolutely key that it's um, you know that your your measurement and your metrics and your expectations are set up correctly in the beginning. So what we typically do is we have a, a set of uh, we call them KPIs, key performance indicators, and we break it out based on a, a number of different things that we measure on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and on a monthly basis. So a few of those might be just to start might be a number of calls that are expected per day. We realize that this varies based on um, how many patients they're getting a hold of or this, the complexity of the inclusion exclusion or the therapeutic indication, but we, we tell, you know, we make it clear that we expect an average amount of calls per day, whether it's anywhere from 100 to 150 or 50, whatever it may be, de depending on the therapeutic indication, we make that very clear up front. The second thing and that we make clear... I, 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 yeah, that's a good point that you had there. How many... Uh, how many calls to new patients are they making, and how many calls are they making to patients that are already in their database? Is there a way that you, should, you would track that, or, or you know, is there a certain expectation you have? Is it dependent on the study? What do you, you know, what do you typically do there? Yeah, it definitely depends on uh, on the amount of patients in the database. So obviously, if there's a smaller database that they burn through right away, the total volume of calls might be less, just because it might be a different strategy and they might be just fielding the external calls that are coming in. So maybe it'd be a fewer calls in that situation and there'd be more time spent with um, you know, maximizing contact with referral source outreach or, or spreading collateral or other parts of the strategy. So you definitely wanna tailor your, um, your expectation on number of calls with the other factors that surround that study. Every study needs to have a customized strategy and your overall measurement should take that into consideration. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. And, and that's in regards to, again, just your, your outreach attempts. So whether your outreach attempts is calls or referral sources, whatever it may be, the, the expectation needs to be set on the volume of what, um, what, what is expected. The second thing that we, uh, we really look at very closely is it's pretty simple. It's, it's the, both the number of patients that you're speaking with per day, so the number of pre-screens, as well as the number of pre-screen passes is a big one for us. So we're looking at the number of screening visits scheduled, if you will. That would be a pre-screen pass. And for a lot of our recruitment staff, on average, again, it's, it, it changes drastically through all the different studies. It could be anywhere from two to three to four visits per day that we want to see scheduled um, that's generated from them. So we look at the pre-screen passes uh, uh, quite closely. And then, of course, we look at randomization visits. So we're looking at those patients that they're producing and we're seeing how many of those patients are actually making into the study, how many are being screen failed out at visit one, what's going on with the, with the, the patients that they're identifying. But either way, we, we, we set those expectations and we, um, and we look at them very closely. And that brings me up to another point, I know I'm rambling on here, but it's, it's the tracking mechanism. So you gotta have a way to track it and you can either do it through your CTMS platform or you can do it through just an old fashioned Google tracker or write it on a piece of paper, but you've got to track the daily output and you've got to look at it. So if you're managing that staff, you've got to be looking at it on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, um, and, and revising it accordingly. Well, what about that, uh, you mentioned pre-screen passes and, and uh, you know, tracking that metric, but a lot of sites ask me, you know, what about that ambiguous criteria, you know, those gray areas? How do you prevent from over, you know, pre-screen failing patients um, in order to hit your randomization numbers. Because as you know, um, from working at a site, I mean, the criteria is becoming harder and harder, and you need kind of every patient that you, uh, you know, that may qualify. How do you work around that? You know, I, I think a, a, a large part of, of what we do as, um, as a recruiter is, you know, we, we have to study the inclusion exclusion in its entirety. We have to have full understanding of it. Literally, you know, every part of the inclusion, every part of the exclusion, your prohibited meds, um, your, your, you know, every component that's, um, that's, that's involved. And, and part of inclusion exclusion, there are gray areas. And by those gray areas, that's the judgment of the PI. That should be left up to the judgment of the clinician at the screening visit. And the things like um, 
maybe it's an uncontrolled medical condition. Well, what's controlled and uncontrolled? You know, that's, a, that's up to the discretion of the PI. Um, we see a lot of studies where patients are excluded out if they've taken uh, three, uh, three different medications within the same fa family, but they haven't really taken a, uh, the, the full dose of those medications to exclude one of those. They've only tried it once or twice. They didn't take the full prescribed regimen. So then that's just two scenarios. There's another hundred of them where there's the gray areas, and you have to leave it up to the physician to make their discretion. And we always encourage our recruiters to, to, you know, really understand the gray areas, understand what the judgment is, and make sure not to over pre-screen fail out any of the patients. Now, we would rather see them bring the patients in and the, and the clinical team look at the patient and say, okay, based on this situation, this was the reason that they didn't qualify, and then they communicate that back to the pre-screener. It's so important that they're communicating that back and it's so important that the recruitment staff doesn't look at that communication as in a negative way. It's part of the workflow, and it allows them to optimize their process moving forward. And um, yeah, so it's just it's just so important. We see uh, we see guys that are, are jumping out of the gate pre-screening, and there's you know they're just so picky with the things that that uh, that where patients really qualify because it's based on the medical judgment, and they shouldn't be making those decisions. Yeah, no, definitely a, a good point. Uh, I know that um, you know it's very important. Um, so now that we've kind of talked about what makes kind of a good enrollment specialist, a good outreach specialist, you know, what should they ask? Uh, if they're on the phone with a patient, they call, they you know review the inclusion exclusion. What should they be talking to these patients about? What shouldn't they be talking to the patients about? Yeah, I, you know it's. Again, it's, we're a little old fashioned in that um, they should be going over the inclusion exclusion in its entirety. Uh, I know I, I feel like there's, there's a lot of pre screening questionnaires that you can make and these different tools that you can use, use. But when it comes down to it, you know, you have to go over inclusion and uh, exclusion thoroughly and obviously exclude any of the, of the, the a lot of the medical uh, judgment or the different ratings that have to be done at, at the screening visits. Um, so that's the first thing. The second one is prohibited medications. You got to get a full uh, list of their medications. You got to know what the start date is, what they're taking it for, what the milligrams are. Uh, you have to get full understanding of their medical history. So all of their diagnosis, um, anything that's currently symptomatic or uncontrolled, you, you, know, you know, we have to be getting a list of. And it should all, at that point, you should be entering it into your CTMS platform um, to allow for that data to be used down the line with future studies. If you don't have a CTMS platform, you know, you're keeping questionnaires, definitely be keeping a detailed questionnaire that you can enter down the line um, and utilize. A few of the other things that we typically try to go over is, uh, number one is the, the, the time involved in the study. So the, uh, the frequency of the visits, how long the screening visit is, how long the different visits are, um, what to bring at the visits, whether or not a caregiver has to come or if it's a morning visit or afternoon visit. So we're really going over the, the expectations of the study, uh, just to make sure that they can even meet the, the required timelines based on their own schedule. Yeah, it's definitely important to make sure that the patients know exactly what they're getting into, um, you know, ahead of time um, to, to avoid any questions later. Um, I have a question coming in here. What if uh, what if you're working on a study where there's a tough procedure? Um, I know that this specific question is in reference to um, a lumbar puncture that's involved um, with an Alzheimer's study, how do, you, how do you suggest that the enrollment specialist communicate that to the patient? Um, what kinds of questions should they answer um, or, or should they bring it up at all? That's a great question. I, you know, so first of all, the dialogue needs to be, um, uh, I don't want to say elementary, but, you know, it, it definitely, the, the patient needs to be able to understand um, what you're describing. And, this gets into the pre-screening -screen, pre questionnaire. You can outline that question that you want to ask them in your dialogue and put it in your pre-screening questionnaire. And when you submit it to your IRB, they'll also be able to review the language and approve it. But I would suggest that, you know, first of all, you, you disclose everything that's involved. So there's no shocks when they come in, especially if they're traveling long distance. So I would recommend that you, you describe the lumbar puncture um, and then you, you touch base with your PI your, or your sub-I to, to go over a little bit of a, um, a, a mock question scenario where, where you explain it to, um, where, you, where he helps you come up with the, 
the, uh, the answer for the question, exactly how he wants it explained so that the patient understands it and it's at a level that the patient understands. So I would, I would suggest that you work with your clinician, and clinician or your, your, either your PI or your sub-I to find out how to answer some of those questions and keep it at the level that they want. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely, uh, definitely a good, uh, good point there. Um, great question. Um, any other questions that come in, um, definitely uh, um, let us know uh, if you have any other questions. Um, so we talked a lot about how um, the outreach specialists work with the investigator. Um, how would the outreach specialist work with the coordinators? You know, how, what kind of interface would you suggest for, for that to be a successful relationship? That's an important component. Uh, you know, part of our process is that the, the recruitment specialist is involved from day one. So what is day one? It's, it's the SIV, you know, in a lot of ways. It's your kickoff call, your internal kickoff meeting. Um, but you want to be looping in your recruitment specialist to all the training. It's so important that they have an understanding of the inclusion, exclusion, and the gray areas of, you know, and how things roll out. Things change throughout the study, so you want them to understand the full, uh, the full story behind any of the changes. So the first thing that we would recommend is directly from the beginning. Um, the second thing is, with a lot of our recruitment specialists, they're sending an email every single day regarding how many screening visits are scheduled and they're, they're CCing the director and the coordinator. This allows two things. Number one, it allows us to track performance and make sure that the volume is there. Number two, it allows the coordinator to uh, potentially go back in and maybe do a, a re-pre-screen over the phone, depending on the complexity of the inclusion exclusion and also the, um, you know, the, how experienced the, the pre-screener is. So we're, we, we're encouraging communication there. Um, we're also encouraging communication at the screen at the I want to say the screen fail visit, but the screening visit. So it's very important again that the the coordinators going back to the pre screener and and letting them know what happened, letting them know you know the patient was a screen fail, what what the reason was. And again, it's not negative. So there's a lot of uh, medical conditions or medical histories that are not disclosed by patients to the pre screener. It doesn't matter how much you dick, it just happens. But there are things that can be improved on. So it's very important that the pre-screener sees 100% of, of uh, the outcome of those visits and that, that, that communication is flowing back. Um, and then the last one is just, you know, I want to call it more the maintenance communication, where you're going over the study on a monthly basis. You're going over maybe uh, revised goals, whether or, not you're, um, whether or not you're hitting your goals or you're, you, know, you need to reallocate resources and time to hit your goals to make the client happy. Um, so it's very important that you're looking at that on an ongoing moving basis. Um, also any amendments, so any amendments to the protocol, any changes in uh, uh, any of the criteria or any, any additional um, defined criteria that are being rolled out by the sponsor based on questions that are coming in from the site. You want to be going over that on a monthly basis. So communication is key. It, it has to be there for, uh, for the uh, pre screeners to mitigate issues and, and maximize uh, you know, uh, performance. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have another question coming in here. So for a smaller site, um, and, and I guess I can phrase, rephrase it this way, um, when is it the right time to hire somebody like an outreach specialist? You know, if, you know, as another staff member, you know, this, this uh, question coming in, it sounds like it's from a smaller site um, that maybe is more just a PI and a coordinator. Um, when is it time to hire an outreach specialist and when is it, you know, worth it for the site to invest in personnel like that? Yeah, I think that, um, so most site owners and any of the site owners on the phone um, or directors will understand that the, the life cycle of a site. You start a site, uh, a lot of us started off wearing many hats, like I said. So you, you start off doing regulatory, you start off doing finance, and then you start coordinating. And before you know it, and you're pre-screening. So you're pre-screening as part of it. Before you know it, your your visits get to a certain level at the site on a weekly basis where, um, you know, you, you have to have the pre-screening to continue to generate the visits to allow the coordinators to maximize the amount of visits that you've seen. And there is a, a tipping point in revenue. And I, I don't really, I don't know when exactly that is. I would say that it's, um, you know, probably anywhere if you have one coordinator that's seeing, um, 10 patients a week, it's probably time for a pre-screener. And depending on, on your reserves that you have to, 
to fund the operations, but it is going to be worth it from a, a break-even point. And we see that one pre-screener can generate anywhere from 700000 to $1.2 million based on producing three screenings a week, a, a, a day. Um, and based on, I, I have some calculations that if we assumed four randomizations, four patients that were randomized a week at a $6,500 budget, it's, it's greater than a million dollars. So the, um, you know, the, the, the strategy is there where it's, it, it definitely adds value. And it's, re it's really your only way that you can bring your site to the next level if you're at a, a certain number of visits per week. Say you're seeing 20 patients per week. You're trying to get that 30, 40 mark and maximize your coordinator uh, value. We do see that having the pre-screening team is, is vital, whether it's in-house or whether it's uh, outsourced uh, to another company. Okay. Have you seen any sort of... Uh whether you take it in-house or, or, or outsource it to another company, have you seen one strategy that's that better than another, or um, have you seen it work both ways? It works both ways. It definitely works both ways. Um, a lot of guys do start it in-house, and then they, they what they would do is they would outsource the overflow. So say they have one or two guys in-house that are pre-screening, those are your fixed guys, but then they have a balloon of studies. Based on our industry, we don't see too much consistency. So um, if there's a balloon of studies, they may outsource the overage so that they don't have to take on the additional payroll risk. Um, but no, we've definitely seen it work both ways. Um, you know, one other comment I, I would give back to the uh, hiring in house is that um, is that there's a lot of trial and error. If you hire a person that doesn't work, that's okay. It doesn't work for any of us on the first time. Get that other person in there and try it out. Think outside the box um, regarding uh, you know the the type of person that you're looking for, but you know, you're not going to get it right on the first time. It's very important that you keep trying. The, the right people will will eventually be set up. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, I, I would definitely know your numbers and understand uh, what that point is of when you want to add that additional person as well. So when you hit that certain amount of revenues or amount of visits, you know, you should be looking at your your site on a uh, on a what's called an accrual basis, which means you're you're looking at the revenue in real time, not when it's received. It's what you're produced. Then you should know when you want to add that second person and when it's justified, and then maybe even add that third person. Um, and as you add one, two, three people, it's it's very important that they're all cross trained on each other's studies. When you're pre screening a patient for one study, you got to know what all the other enrolling studies are because you're going over medical history and everything else, and it's uh, it's just absolutely something that um, that helps uh, be more thorough from the beginning. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and uh, I know that we work with a lot of sites that are enrolling multiple studies in the same indication with slightly different populations. And if you cross-train your your pre-screeners, you can definitely you know enroll each of the studies um, you know much more quickly, which is uh, definitely the goal. So definitely a good point there. Um, so uh, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you uh, one more question, uh, try to end on a lighter note. Um, now, Al has assured me that I will not come into this story this time, as I understand I did last week. Um, but tell me kind of a, a fun uh, pre-screening story you have. Uh, maybe some uh, patient that came in based on kind of an odd pre-screener uh, questionnaire. Um, any stories you have from uh, your time at the site? Gosh, the only pre-screen story I know involves you. I don't know if I can bring that no. up, though. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, in regards to a pre-screening question, uh, let's think here. I can't think of one, but I can think of, um, I, I was uh, training a, a group of coordinators, um, and I, I, I'm not familiar, I'm not really great with the, uh, with the, the conference and the, the video conferences, and I was uh, and I was working from home, and it was it was morning, and I was literally in my pajamas, and I by mistake I hit the video button on the top right hand corner. So all the pre screeners and coordinators. It's not a pre screening story, but let's just say I wasn't seen in the best light. So um, this is my second video conference, and this one's going better, thank God. Well, that's good. Uh, I hope those people that saw you in kind of your indecent clothing uh, didn't make any cracks. <laughs> 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 but, 
Uh, well, thank you, Al, for uh, for joining this webinar. Maybe we'll let you do one uh, in the next few weeks again. Um, we'll have to see. We'll take it back and see if you're allowed back. But um, appreciate all the insight. Um, and uh, join us next week. We'll go over a new topic. And uh, uh, yeah, see everybody next week. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.